So, um, you know, I know that we have a broad audience uh, ranging from uh, really fundamental basic scientists today right through to individuals who are here because they have a loved one who is on the spectrum and they're interested in hearing more. And so, um, you know, I've targeted this talk to be fairly broad, uh, but I have extra slides at the end if anybody wants me to go into a more in-depth discussion of any component. And really what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit of a story of my work through the field of sleep and autism and where that field is going. And the one thing I always want to point out is, you know, within my own department, sleep is its own division. It is actually its own division. It is a huge area. So saying that you're studying sleep and autism is not uh, too dissimilar from saying you're studying brain and autism. So it is something that's quite uh, uh, broad. And so I'll only be really talking about a few pieces where we've made some headway in the last few years. So just for those of you, a tiny brief over, uh, sort of overview of what is sleep. I mean, at its most fundamental, it's an absence of wake. It's a change in behavior, and it results from complex physiologic process in that you get a, a lack of awareness of your external environment. You don't respond anymore to your surroundings. And there's a lot of core physiological changes that occur when you're sleeping, including reduced respiration rates, reduced heart rates, muscle tone becomes atonic. So there's a lot of things that happen. One of the simplest ways to think about sleep is actually to consider the difference between traveling business class and being able to lie flat and traveling coach over a long distance and actually being at an incline. And that will tell you a lot about uh, sleep. And you know there's a huge difference. So why is it that it's different to be at 45 degree angle and actually to be totally different and wake up fresh if you're flat? And part of that is the latter one. It's the fact that we lose muscle tone when we sleep. So your body can't totally relax and go into a deep sleep if it knows it's kind of still holding itself upright, which it does when you're in those coach seats. But if you get business class and you're lucky enough to sleep business class, you can actually bypass the traditional jet lag to a large degree because of this latter physiological change. So here's just a very broad overview that gives you kind of the sense of the different stages of sleep. Basically what happens is you're awake and you have what we call a preponderance of beta waves, which are you know, kind of high activity brain waves that start to diminish and go into a lower voltage rate as you start to fall asleep. And we transition through four main stages, which are really going through these alpha waves, which are a little less than beta waves, and then through what we call deep sleep waves, which are theta and then delta waves, are really the hallmark of deep sleep. And then you go into something that most everybody here has probably heard of, which is rapid eye movement sleep. And rapid eye movement sleep, also called paradoxical sleep, because the brain waves can actually be very similar to awake waves, is actually one component that seems to be particularly important for neurodevelopmental function when one is young. And you cycle out of that back into your stage one, stage two, and so forth throughout the night. And depending on how many hours of sleep you get, the average individual can actually have maybe four or five even cycles of these kinds of sleep over the course of the evening. Each stage, as I mentioned, is hallmarked by these different types of brain waves. And what's happened in the last, uh, I'd say, 50 years has been a marvelous increase in our ability to recognize what stage of sleep individuals are actually in by measuring very basic fundamental sleep EEG. It doesn't take a lot. Just a few electrodes can tell you actually which stage you're in. So that awake stage is these beta waves, which are high frequency, low voltage. You transition then to these alpha waves in the first period of sleep into theta waves. And then into stage two sleep and stage three sleep. We used to have stage three and four, but it's hard to distinguish those apart. And it was felt that really the sleep association of sleep medicine felt there was no need for actually separating those. So it's just called deep sleep phase or uh, stage three. It no longer really breaks apart stage four. And then REM sleep. And one of the things that happens, and probably most of you are well aware of here, is that as you get older, your ability to engage in some of these stages of sleep differs substantially. 
So when you're young, you actually have a huge percentage of your sleep is REM, particularly in the very early infant stages, and a lot of slow wave sleep. And then you can start to see that that starts to diminish actually quite dramatically over the decades. And by the time you get to my age, you have more trouble falling asleep and you wake much earlier. And actually in older adults, which is the other part of the work that I do, we see quite a reduction in deep wave sleep over the, the uh, decades, particularly from 55 on. Uh, as a young child, however, what you actually see is a preponderance of REM sleep. And that's considered to be particularly important for neuronal development and for the formation of memory and other cognitive abilities. Now, a lot of that evidence comes from animal studies. So it's really a little still inferential, but that's the general idea. So if you, and the average length of sleep actually totally changes. So for example, infants will engage in 16 hours, toddlers typically 10 hours, when they get to school age, it's nine to 10 on average, teenagers eight to 10, though there's a lot of evidence coming out from the lab of William Dement and others uh, that in fact, teenagers need more. Adults typically seven to eight, there's huge variability. But by the time you get to 55, you're starting to see a huge reduction in actually the total sleep time. So why should we care about sleep and particularly in the context of autism, which is what I'm here to talk about today? Well, there isn't a person in the room that doesn't realize that if you had a bad night's sleep, it's going to impact your mood, it's going to impact your cognition, and it's going to impact your behavior. So you're more likely maybe to fly off the handle at a significant other if you've had a very bad night's sleep. You're more likely to be irritable with your boss or vice versa if you had a bad night's sleep. You're also not the kind of person who's probably gonna to want to take an exam or do anything that's cognitively high demand if you've had a bad night's sleep. Every aspect of brain function can be impacted by having dysregulated sleep. So if you're thinking of this in the context of a disorder where in fact cognitive symptoms, behavioral problems are part of the core, then it makes a lot of sense that if a child on the spectrum has dysregulated sleep, those may become actually components that are particularly impacted and therefore more difficult for the family. There's been a lot of complaints. Parents complain a lot about the sleep of their children on the spectrum. So it doesn't only affect the child, it's likely that it also affects the health and well-being of the family. But from my own perspective, one of the things that I find particularly interesting is I think characterizing sleep dysregulation in autism spectrum disorders can go a long way to potentially telling us more about autism itself more about the fundamental physiology, it can provide potentially a window to etiology. It might also guide us to the subgroups of individuals or kinds of subtypes of autism that might exist. It might be an avenue where we can do that for help us refine our phenotypes of autism spectrum disorders. It may also help us identify ba valuable biomarkers. Maybe there are particular types of sleep architecture that can tell us which child is more vulnerable to developing more impaired cognition over time, or indeed on a given day, which one is more vulnerable to having behavioral deficits when in fact they go to school, which is a huge issue for caregivers. And then sleep disorders or sleep dysregulation can be treated. As I get further and further on in my own career, and I know how challenging it is to reach the uh, etiology of any brain disorder. I have to say I become more focused on those components that might provide an avenue for treatment even when we have not yet reached a full understanding of what's going on from a brain mechanism point of view. So when I was actually invited onto the DSM, which can be much maligned, but I was in fact uh, very struck at the number of sleep disorders that now have really, really good treatments available for them. So forefront, uh, to my view, is if you have a sleep disorder and you're a child on the spectrum or an adult on the spectrum, can we actually do something that just makes your day-to-day -day functioning a little better? And that was one of the reasons I actually ended up sort of branching into sleep and autism. 
Uh, so on the DSM-5, one of the big changes, as you probably all know, but just to recap very briefly, we're not just in the sleep-wake work group, where we saw a lot of changes, but also when it came to autism spectrum disorders, which were broadened to include Asperger's disorder, as well as pervasive developmental delay, not otherwise specified. So autism spectrum disorders are now a very broad category, at least from the DS5 perspective and from a diagnostic perspective. And as most of you in the room know, but just to recap, really the core symptoms are impairments in social communication, re restricted repetitive patterns, language delay or impairments, though in some individuals language can be phenomenal, there's tremendous variability. And also uh, the result of all of those is there's significant impairment across the lifespan. Uh, symptoms present in early development, and one of the themes that I'm particularly interested in are those aspects of the development of autism that we would say are beyond the brain. So we've a lot of focus, particularly through the National Institutes of Mental Health recently, on systems that are very linked to brain neurocircuitry. And it makes a lot of sense. But where we've only started more recently to actually get into interrogating is the extent to which other systems, sleep systems, immune function, and other components that might be considered beyond the brain actually impact cognition, function, not only in autism, but across a range of disorders. And one that is particularly of interest to me, of course, goes without saying, is sleep. But I am not the first person, or not even close to being one of the first people to think of sleep in the context of autism spectrum disorders. What's happened is that over the years, and we've carried out survey after survey of parents and their concerns and their uh, sort of a sense and observations of their children on the spectrum, sleep is one of the main areas that parents complain about. So multiple studies of parental report suggest that sleep disturbances are extremely common in autism spectrum disorder. And the dominant complaints are as follows. 44% approximately say that their child has trouble falling asleep. 31 say the child has trouble maintaining sleep. And about 30% say the child wakes early. And some of these overlap, but they don't all overlap. So it's not always the same parent who's saying that the child wakes early that says they have a disrupted night's sleep. It's quite a, a mixture and combination of these particular complaints. But overall, the complaints range, depending on the survey you read, from about 44 to 86%. So it's a huge problem and concern for parents. And over the years, about I'd say in the 90s, we saw a series of studies uh, that really showed that actually those individuals on the spectrum, when the parents thought they had worse sleep, actually weren't doing as well. They seemed to have worse uh, mood problems. They seemed to have more uh, poor communi communication skills. They also seemed to be overall lower functioning. But these were all predicated on parental observations. And one of the very first studies to really see if, in fact, parental observations are correct, if they're accurate, was conducted in 2008 using what was then called a standard Actograph or ActorWatch. This is your Fitbit. Everyone in the room is probably wearing one today. And this tells you how active you are when you're sleeping. And lack of activity is seen as actually the proxy for sleep. So in this study, which was really comprehensive, it was one of the largest ever done to date at that time, they had 68 individuals on the spectrum, and then they were very uh, smart. They did a very good control population, not just of typical developing, but also developmental delay. And overall, the conclusion of this study was that parents were exaggerating or overinterpreting the extent to which their children actually had dysregulated sleep, those children on the spectrum. What they found was that total time in bed was, in fact, shorter. If you're on the spectrum, you can see that there. And overall, children on the spectrum had less sleep and less napping, because they examined napping as well over the course of a day. So there was overall really decreased sleep duration over 24 hours. So that's that number there, 10 hours versus 11 versus 11, 14. So we're really talking about 45 minutes. But in the course of a night, when you're talking about seven hours, brace a half an hour, that can be a difference for parents, but it doesn't seem so dramatic. So by 
2010, when I started to look at this area of research first, I noted that really there was a limited number of objective studies. Uh, uh, the actigraphy study was about the only one. Uh, there had been dominantly parental reports. Some people used more in-depth reports, what we call sleep diaries. There were these couple of studies of the uh, acti actigraphy measure of activity. Tom Anders up at the Mind Institute had done some very nice video recordings of children with spe on the spectrum sleeping and also suggested there wasn't too much dysregulation. But there was no study at that time of using the full polysonography, the full standard EEG sleep assessment. So we really didn't have that. So the vast majority of studies employed either parental reports, sleep diaries, or actigraphy, fewer, but there were a few, but not polysonography. Now the problem is that if you were to think about the field of sleep, it's really divided into three broad areas. Sleep disorders, which include things like insomnia, but also sleep disorder breathing, periodic limb movement, restless leg syndrome. Then there's a whole host of circadian rhythm and circadian dysregulation components. And then there's a neuroscience of sleep, which is focused on everything from the sleep architecture to fundamental sleep physiology, which parts of the brain control sleep, which genes control sleep. And they don't often interact. They're relatively independent. But for the first, sleep disorders, and for the sleep architecture, you really need to have the full polysonography. Circadian rhythms can be assessed fairly well with good sleep diaries and with the otigraphy, but not the other two domains. But full uh, polysonography was not a standard, doesn't, uh, you know, and the others do not assess the sleep architecture. So really, uh, one of the difficulties is we couldn't really tell how dysregulated the sleep was. And particularly because otigraphy and videos, they might give you some sense, but they don't tell you if they're microarousals, if the child is in stage one versus stage two sleep. But this is the reason right here why there were so few studies done of the objective sleep polysonography. And the reason is, can you imagine any child, much less a child on the spectrum, undergoing this setup in what is standard at that time was the clinic setting? Very difficult. And to be quite honest, that's not that complicated a protocol or setup. But children on the spectrum have such trouble with new environments. They're extremely neophobic. They have social communication difficulties. So you can imagine for researchers the range of problems this raised. Even these lab approaches of polysonography have some limitations. They're not always considered ecologically valid. Any one of you would know where you, when you even stay over in a hotel, your sleep is different than when you're at home in your own bed. Uh, this is particularly difficult for patients on the spectrum, particularly those who might be low functioning, have trouble actually communicating, but all of them can have difficulty, not to mention they often have sensory deficits or sensory sensitivities, which means putting on an electrode is already a troubling event. And it also means that if you actually get a study going on polysonography, you're probably going to have something of a sample bias because only those children who are able to actually tolerate the protocol will in fact engage. So I was very fortunate uh, and, you know, in that the Simons Foundation uh, funded me to actually see if we could conduct this in an ambulatory way. And this was a way that the field was moving to assess older adults and many other different kinds of patient cohorts was to do these sleep studies in, uh, in the home and not stay overnight, actually have equipment that was much more manageable, came with a cap and so forth. And so I was granted a, 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 a some funds to actually examine the range and type of sleep disorders in ASD to see if this impacted cognitive and behavioral symptoms, and also to examine for particular uh, specific patterns of differences in the uh, sleep architecture. Were there any differences that really separated children on the spectrum from typical development? So this is the system here that we use. It's a, a very standardized, continuously well-validated -valid system used by a lot of sleep labs, including our own at Stanford, and by many, many uh, companies when they go out to the home to do sleep assessments for insurance purposes. It's very comprehensive. It gives you everything. It gives you the full sleep EEG. It tells you about nasal airway pressure. It tells you how the oxygen is, how the breathing is, the EKG, so forth. And just to give you a measure of the kind of data that's yielded, this is 30 seconds of data. 
So from every child who might be asleep for eight hours, we'll get eight hours of this kind of data. And this is one epoch. And it shows that you can tell whether or not the individual is actually having a sleep apneic event here. You can tell that's in blue. Uh, if their oxygen actually desaturates, we can tell their leg movement. We can tell their eye movement when they're in REM. I mean, the detail here, and we have to date, we're still actually analyzing this data because there's so much of it. So what we did is we implemented a systematic behavioral desensitization system to see if actually we could um, do these assessments on the children on the spectrum. So we went do an initial visit to the home to do the consent and assent. We bring a booklet on the process. We do everything. We allow them to hook us up. We hook them up. We let them. We hook parents up and siblings up, dolls, teddy bears, you name it. Anything to make this child comfortable with the system, including leaving them with the leads for the legs, the leads for the chest, and a cap, which is a, a faux cap, but the same caps we use, so that they can actually wear the system as much as possible, self-direct it, and then the parents call us when they think the child is ready to undergo the real thing. The most difficult part is actually the cannula, which is that which assesses for the sleep disorder breathing. That was the one that we found people had much, uh, you know, the, the greatest difficulty with. And we leave the equipment in the home for wearing at night on the ch uh, family feels the child is ready. And so that cannula, as you can see there, is measuring actually airflow and nasal flow. And that's the one that gives you your best assessment of sleep disorder breathing. And unfortunately, that's the one the kids really like least because it actually pokes into the nose a little bit. So what we did was actually train the parents. We put it on the top of the head and train the parents actually to implement that after the child fell asleep. We would stay pretty much till the child asleep. Then the system is really pretty uh, self-sustaining. We would leave and pick it up in the morning. We even got to the extent, because of the cords there, we got to the point of even making little funnels on their pajamas so that, in fact, we could insert it and not make sure that we're not in any way impacting the child. So, uh, and so we published last year the results of this, and we found that we actually tested 161 individuals we recruited, of whom 93 had a diagnosis of autism, 23 had a diagnosis of developmental delay, and 45 were typical developing. And what we found actually was quite interesting. We really found no difference in our ability to perform a full ambulatory polysonography assessment on the children with autism. It was purely the time it took them to actually do this based on the systematic desensitization that differed. So if you can see in the last line of the results there, what we says is individuals with ASD took much longer. They took on average 16 days to get to the point that parents called us and said they think they could do it. Whereas it was only eight days for those who were developmentally delayed, and it was less than a day, meaning we could actually go to the home, show the child who was typical developing, and they would even elect to do it on that night and say, oh, I can do it now. Uh, this was across the age range of three years to uh, 21. I think we had a few a little older than that, but that was uh, really a broad age range. So we found actually this is very achievable. As long as you put in the time and effort, you can actually get this uh, assessment from children on the spectrum. Uh, and it was independent of function, actually. We had quite a range of function. We did not find that be, to be a factor at all. It was more the ability to work with the parents. We had very few. A little bit of younger age was a factor. So, uh, uh, you know, if they were younger, they were more on the younger side if they actually tended not to be able to undergo it. But this didn't differ whether or not they were actually uh, ASD or not. So as a result of this, we actually, one of the very first things we did is say, well, now here's some proof. We have these surveys that the parents actually have filled out for us as well. Now let's go back and see how this compares to, in fact, uh, the actual sleep as measured by the full polysonography by the parent. Are these parents actually good predictors? Because if they're good predictors of how the sleep is, you know, maybe you don't have to put all these kids through this trouble. But this is the first kind of study. And in fact, this was done by my pre-doctoral fellow who's doing this for her thesis. And we found they're actually great predictors of how long it takes their child to fall asleep. 
But needless to say, and it makes total sense, once the child is asleep, the parent is likely asleep. And that's when we don't actually get good information from the parent anymore. They have no sense of how dysregulated the sleep is. Uh, they don't know if they snore. They don't know if they move too much. They're not making good estimates of that. And that makes absolute sense because they're trying to get their sleep at the same time. So parents are not very accurate predictors of anything post the time it takes to fall asleep. So it means really in order to actually fully understand what's going on with the sleep, we probably need this assessment-based process. So what did we find? What did we actually find? Well, we found very similar to other individuals have found. And this is in a cohort of 80 autism, 31 developmental delay, and 44 controls. We found that actually they do have shorter absolute total sleep time as measured by the polysonography. That means they're in absolute sleep, which you know for sure less than the developmental delay or uh, typical developing controls. They also have more wake episodes after they fall asleep. They've a little less, you know, marginal, but uh, stage one sleep, which is interesting. They have less REM sleep, and it takes them much longer to enter a stage of REM sleep. So it's almost actually what we are finding on our assessments is they almost skip that first period of REM. It's like they go through it, they don't get a good period of REM, and then maybe they catch up later in the night. But on average, it's taking them far longer, 160 minutes to actually, on average, enter a period of REM sleep. So this is quite dramatic. In fact, our findings are very, very duplicative of a smaller study done by Ashura Buckley. In fact, very similar findings who found exactly the same with total sleep time. In her case, what she found was interesting. She found stage three slow wave sleep was increased. We did not find that. But again, she found reduction in REM sleep and again, an increase in REM sleep latency. Her children were actually uh, of age range two to 13, one to six and two to seven. So it was a, mar a narrower age range and not quite as many, but very similar findings. So rapid eye movement sleep has certainly been characterized as you know, low muscle tone, rapid low voltage EEG. But the reason we're interested in it in the context of ASD is it has been considered to be very important for cognition and for behavior. But the vast majority of that data, there, you know, there is some human data, but a lot of that data comes from animal studies. It does not come from human studies. And they're very controlled human studies where you get the test exactly the next day. We have far less in the literature about the relationship of REM sleep to your cognition more broadly defined. You know, so it was interesting for us to look at this, and that's one of the next things that we did. This is just a tiny, uh, you know, what you call a break in the momentum here to show that uh, how important REM sleep is. It's a great slide from a Nature Neuroscience Review. And I don't know how they figured it out, but apparently dinosaurs did not have REM. But there you go. Uh, so uh, the other advantage of REM is that it can be treated. So actually, Ashura Buckley, uh, who's at the uh, National Institutes of Health, did an open label trial of denepazil, which you've mostly heard of in the context of actually increasing uh, cholinergic function for treatment of dementia. But of course, that also helps stimulate REM. And uh, she did just five subjects uh, in a very narrow age range in a lab context. But she had eight separate sleep studies at three possible doses. And she found significant increase in REM and decrease of REM latency. Now, she told me personally that one thing that was a little perturbing for her was that she did not see an association with cognition. And what was interesting, uh, when you have only five subjects, uh, it was a good proof of concept paper, you know, you tend to say, well, it's too small a sample to really figure this out. So uh, we did uh, a look at this, and I tried to get the, the, I don't know why the gradient blue. So we decided, OK, let's look at our sample. We've got IQ. We have the Peabody uh, vocabulary test. And sure enough, independent controlling for age and gender, we see this very standard, nice relationship between increased REM and better performance in our typical developing and also in our developmental delay. And this uh, on the bottom is the Peabody vocabulary test, which is considered to be a very good measure of how functional the child is. 
we saw absolutely no relationship whatsoever in our uh, uh, children with autism. And we went back actually post one of my Simon's meetings where somebody said, did you really parse out gender? Makes no difference. Gender or age is not making a difference here. This is actually not associated in our cohort in any way with uh, these uh, uh, cognitive or behavioral or other components. And we're not sure why. But we got a little bolstered when uh, last year a study came out, very small study, but also using polysonography, in 13 neurotypical and 13 children on the spectrum. And they found actually a stronger relationship with both emotional memory and also found it more for theta activity than for REM. So theta activity is that sort of slower wave activity. And there they found that actually individuals who were more theta were in fact, uh, who had better theta uh, activity showed overnight improvement in an emotional task. So we decided to look recently at theta activity in our cohort, but we did it very differently. So theta activity occurs in what we would call stage three sleep, typically stage two to stage three, you're going into theta. If you're an adult, you will see that go into even delta waves. We're less likely to see delta waves in children. What we did was actually characterize the amount of additional theta activity above and beyond being in the presence of actually the stage where you'd expect it. So having that kind of slow wave activity at times when you shouldn't expect it, at the onset of sleep, in other sleep periods. And we found that actually 47% of our children on the spectrum had in fact excessive theta activity. We found one such child in our typical developing cohort. So this was a striking difference. When we didn't do this based on the percentage of stage two or stage three sleep, but actually looked at the theta activity independently in end of times during sleep when you would not expect theta activity, they had a far greater preponderance of it. And it's interesting because you typically see that in typical developing children when they're younger. And indeed our only one child who showed it who's typical developing is under five. But we found it in all ages, as you can see here, of our children actually on the spectrum. What's more is we found actually this preponderance of theta activity was associated with differences in behavior. They had far more problems with these repetitive behaviors that we see so standardly in autism. They had more difficulty on externalizing problems on the cognitive behavior, uh, child behavioral checklist. This is a measure overall of how many behavioral problems you have. Now, not for the total score, on the externalizing, things that are more obvious, more hitting, more other kinds of behaviors. Also, when it came to socialization, this is where we found the most dramatic difference. The children on the spectrum who actually had more theta activity uh, suggesting potentially more immature brain function actually had far less social uh, skill ability as measured by the Vineland. So these are just hot off the press findings, but very striking to us that in fact, it's not sufficient probably just to take a broad sleep uh, PSG and say, well, we can really define the different sleep stages, but it may really count when during sleep this kind of activity occurs and whether or not is within or outside of the regular time period when that activity is hallmarked. So why no association to come back of REM with cognition and behavior? Broad but not specific brain regions are covered in sleep PSG. So that's, we also, we do essentially a six to eight lead EEG. So that doesn't give you a lot of really defined information about specific brain regions. If we have the luxury going forward of trying to do these broader 256 leads, EEGs would give you much better resolution. It may be that in fact there are particular parts of the brain that are more impacted than others, so that in fact if you were more focused on that and rather than a broad EEG, you would capture that more. We only used non-emotional tasks. That was the dominant uh, focus for us. And the findings that have come out in the literature tended to have used a theory of mind or other kind of emotional communication-based tasks. So it may be those systems are different. Theta waves may be, and maybe REM is not the place really what we should be looking at at these theta waves, theta oscillations, which in other circumstances in animal work have been related to inhibition, which has been considered to be a component of neuronal function that might be impaired. 
in individuals on the spectrum. Or it could be something too, also, uh, in terms of the lack of finding with REM. Maybe REM isn't the issue so much as something else driving the reduction in REM. And so this brings me to some of the other aspects of uh, sleep and autism that we've become aware of and that we're focused on. What I'm focusing on in terms of the sleep EEG is only one component for measuring, in fact, uh, the sleep architecture. But there is a veritable cottage industry right now of research on circadian rhythms, particularly looking at impaired melatonin ASD. So melatonin is produced, uh, its production increases in the evening, and that's what helps all of us fall asleep. And if you're in a dark environment like here in the, and the lights are muted, it can be easy to fall asleep, even in the Jerry uh, Fischbach Auditorium or on your plane or any number of different uh, venues. But the melatonin levels peak in the middle of the night, but it's very essential in order to get you into that sleep to have this melatonin production, which is seen as being integral to our circadian rhythm overall, not just sleep. So in fact, some excellent work over the last few years has come out both in clinical trials as well in basic physiology that suggests that really melatonin, not only nocturnal, but also throughout the day is reduced in children on the spectrum relative to typical controls. And some individuals have suggested maybe it's this melatonin deficit that actually is associated with the problem of falling asleep in children on the spectrum. So this is you know, a kind of unwieldy slide, but the bottom line is there have been now so many clinical trials using melatonin in children on the spectrum that they've actually done some good meta-analysis. And this particular one that came out in 2011 shows that melatonin can improve both the time to fall asleep and the duration, but it doesn't improve the amount of dysregulation. They are not sleeping more deeply and their sleep maintains and sustains uh, a disturbed profile, which was very interesting. Also, uh, even though it's not here, if you vary the sort of functional level of the individual on the spectrum, there can be very differential response. And there's huge variability in, the, in any individual's response to melatonin. But it is an interesting issue. What's particularly interesting, what we've been funded by another agency to do, the Bay Area Consortium that we have, actually, is to look at whether or not the amount of REM sleep in autism is influenced by circadian rhythm timing. So if your melatonin is not actually mounting the traditional you know, circadian rhythm response to diminish light and getting ready for bed, and if you are, in fact, having an impaired level of melatonin, it's harder for you to get into sleep. And what happens is there's actually a narrow temporal window during which REM sleep is actually strongly promoted by the circadian clock. So you get this overlap between your circadian clock and your actual sleep. They're not one and the same thing entirely. And so what happens is you might w miss that window. So in fact, the argument is what we're seeing when we see this increased REM latency and also this reduced REM that our individuals on the spectrum are maybe just missing, in fact, that first stage of sleep due to impairments in, in fact, melatonin and other aspects of circadian re uh, regulation. The interesting thing about that is the misalignment can be detected easily enough and treated by either light therapy, sleep hygiene, and indeed melatonin itself. So if you do a good characterization of, of the circadian rhythm, which takes at the minimum about two weeks of measuring melatonin, cortisol, doing the sleep EEG, and having a litigraphy watch as well. So it's quite an in-depth protocol, but it's a manageable protocol. You can really get a good strong sense of how someone's circadian rhythm is. And so that's what we're doing to see, in fact, if the finding we observed from the Simons Foundation might actually account for that reduction in REM. The other finding we have is that actually, and this was a very surprising finding, we are the first study to actually look at sleep disorder breathing. Sleep disorder breathing is a huge phenomenon. It affects so many of us, and it's really been uncharacterized, uh, substantially uh, not detected because we don't assess for it, particularly in children. There's a wonderful guy called David Gozal at the University of Chicago who's shown that actually uh, even in typical developing children, there's a huge amount of sleep disorder breathing. And that can re result in your oxygen going down at night. It can result in significant impact on your cognition that we've demonstrated in other populations. We found that in the children on the spectrum, as many as 40% had in fact significant 
sleep disorder breathing is measured by what's called the standard apnea hypopnea index. They had lower average oxygen desaturation and they dropped uh, not further. Interestingly enough, the developmental delay dropped further, but they dropped lower than the typical developing children. They also had um, uh, what you call it, a no increased level of body mass index, which you would actually think maybe it's the children were more overweight, maybe it's age. Those were not factors at all. And also, I mean, the main area of sleep disorder breathing that people typically investigate is what we call obstructive, which is where the upper airway, uh, you get either the tongue or the hypoglossal muscle collapsing in more, and that's what happens. In these children, we also saw a significantly higher level of what we call central apneas. Apneas are a cessation in respiration that comes about more to brain control than it does to any motor or muscle uh, control. So that was kind of interesting. We were about half and half in the spectrum. And uh, a very, uh, the other thing that we saw is that the, the duration of an apneic or hypopneic event, so apnea is where you get a complete cessation in breathing, hypopnea is partial are much longer than for typical developing children. What was very surprising to us, because we got very excited by this, and we thought, well, this is probably one of the good reasons that a lot of these children are actually having cognitive impairment. And as I said to John earlier today, this is when you know you're doing uh, rigorous uh, science, when you get the exact opposite of what you hypothesized. What we found, which was very surprising, was that actually the children who had uh, sleep apnea had, in fact, uh, less uh, uh, behavioral problems than the children who had no sleep apnea or minimal sleep apnea. So we're not sure why that is. One explanation that we've thought about is maybe they're less uh, sleepy and more likely to have a behavioral problem. But that's certainly one of the things that we're now going to investigate further. Uh, the, you know, you could say, well, does, is it worth uh, going after? Some people argue that children often grow out of these sleep disordered events. We shouldn't worry about them too much. I'm not convinced that's the case, and particularly because of the high prevalence in this population. Also, if you just look at this slide, which is a complicated slide, but the actual negative effects on all aspects of physiological function, from immune to insulin resistance, arterial sclerosis. I mean, one of the things we also want to examine here, because we have the EKGs, so we've had the EKGs read in the last year by one of our uh, uh, electrocardiologists to see if, in fact, some of these QT abnormalities that have been noted in individuals with autism spectrum disorder might, in fact, be among those who have, in fact, uh, the sleep apnea. So it may not actually be sufficient to cause overt evidence of impairment in cognition or behavior, but overall it could be extremely bad for their physical health. And that's uh, probably a whole other uh, area that we um, will chart because we think the link here to immune might be particularly important. So just uh, the next few slides to wrap up is sleep dis The one thing is no matter what, sleep disorders provide tremendous treatment opportunities, potentially. So I've given you sort of some of the findings and a lot of the complexity. But if you were even to talk about a, a sleep apnea per se or obstructive sleep apnea, I mean, one of the things that we see in children on the spectrum is they have a significant amount of what we call facial dysmorphometries. And these are really where the upper airway passages developed in an abnormal fashion. And so those are actually rectifiable by surgery and are, in fact, one of the main ways that people address sleep apnea, particularly if it's related to problems in the upper airway passage. We've had a lot of parental report that not only are their children functioning better, but some of their more overt negative behaviors uh, have been alleviated. Um, that's pure uh, feedback from parents, but certainly we've had about five of the children in this cohort go on to actually take those treatments and show no sleep apnea after the effect. Now, they didn't do it just based on my study. They did it on then being referred to the sleep center and then having another assessment a month later to make sure, because before you go to surgery in a child 
with autism, you want to make sure that in fact uh, there, it's really well justified. Continuous positive airway pressure is the other thing where you put on these masks, but the problem is that's very, very difficult for children on the spectrum to sustain. So uh, these are some of the challenges. There is a whole uh, uh, um, group of researchers, uh, Amanda Richdale, who's in Australia, is starting to examine whether or not children on the spectrum also have increased levels of restless leg syndrome. It's highly correlated with periodic limb movements, which we see certainly increased in that cohort. But it also is interesting because one, it has really two main sources. One is actually impairments in the dopamine system, which certainly have been seen in autism spectrum disorders. And it's also been associated with, uh, in fact, um, reductions in ferritin. And there have been about six studies independently in autism not dealing with sleep that have shown actually ferritin deficiencies. So this is where it comes back to we may have a potential here if we do good workup for this that in fact there is a possibility that you're starting to refine some phenotypes. What's also interesting is restless leg syndrome, a much maligned uh, disorder. Uh, Bill Maher even makes fun of it on occasion. But the bottom line is that this is actually something that is one of those disorders where uh, a specific uh, genetic markers have been identified and replicated, including one which is involved in embryonic limb development. So the inferential impact here is that you may gather a cluster of individuals on the spectrum where some systems around the dopamine and ferritin system uh, might be perturbed. And that's a good way when you do sleep assessment of actually honing in on what might be some specific phenotypes. One of the things in doing this study is also I went out to the homes a lot, and I don't know if I have that. Oh, yeah, on the very first one, I should go back. So I went out to a lot of the homes in the beginning to do this, and two things were striking. One thing that is happening in autism, and I've no, uh, nothing other than my own observation, but I would do an interview with the parent and say, so tell me about your child's sleep and all the standard questions, what time they fall asleep and so forth. And one of the things that parents would most complain about is the child fell asleep uh, too late. And then I would ask the essential next question. Is the child sleepy the next day, to the best of your observation? And parents would often say, no, they're not. And I said, so why does it matter to you that they sleep seven hours if you don't think it's having a functional effect because mom and dad sleep eight hours or nine hours? So oftentimes, we have what I call a parental-imposed insomnia on children who are just not sleepy, but whose parents would like them to go to bed, because needless to say, the parents are sleepy. So if you have a six-year-old child in the house who only wants six or seven hours sleep, it can be highly disrupting. But it doesn't mean that that child has trouble going to sleep, per se. So that's one of the problems. But it was very interesting to me when I would go into the house. I am not a behavioral interventionist, and that's not my stock and trade. But I was very struck by the fact that a lot of these rooms where the children sleep are very cluttered, and not cluttered in a negative way, cluttered to give reassurance to the child on the spectrum. Lots of teddy bears, lots of toys, excessively heated so the temperature is warm in order to make sure the child doesn't wake. So there was almost a sort of sedating effect of processes that might not actually be particularly valuable if you're suffering from either sleep dysregulated breathing. So their sleep hygiene was not ideal. Parents, to get a good night's sleep themselves, would often sleep with the child in the bed and actually develop a whole system from early, early on that you know, would actually have most behaviorists uh, in shock. And that's uh, you know, definitely a place where some of my colleagues uh, back at Stanford are very interested in getting more involved in really having more uh, specific sleep hygiene, which can, you know, is a boring kind of component to talk about, but can be highly effective in treating some of these particular components. A lot of people go for the supplemental melatonin. Problem with supplemental melatonin is it doesn't work in everybody, and not only that, is it can mask other sleep disorders. So it may be actually an ideal way to go if you've ruled out other sleep disorders, but it can actually minimize the adaptive response of a child who is actually suffering from sleep disorder breathing. Anything that's sedating can do that. So there are difficulties and cautions, and yet a lot of people, for needless to say, for a lot of good reason, are actually trying melatonin by themselves. And like all medications, should not be given unless it's uh, with the kind of involvement of your physician, uh, just in case there are interactions.
Just to recap, uh, sleep disorders may provide clues to the biomarkers and phenotypes of ASD, as I spoke about. Uh, REM deficiency, uh, but not just REM deficiency, other components of the sleep architecture might tell us a little bit more about, in fact, how the neurons are developing. And in fact, we have some basic uh, studies where we're trying to track this at a neuronal level uh, at the same time as we're looking at, in fact, the clinical outcome data. Sleep apnea doesn't just uh, speak to uh, issues to do with obstruction, but it also could be associated with increased uh, um, uh, hypoxia during early neur uh, neuronal development. There's a lot of evidence to show that children who actually are vulnerable to SIDS have impairments in the serotonergic system, which has also been implicated in some of the studies that we have on children on the spectrum, that that may be a neurotransmitter system also that is not as efficiently working. So there may be actually some overlap between the serotonergic system and a propensity to, in fact, uh, develop sleep disorder breathing. And then you may actually have a situation we're just examining now, thanks to the Simons Foundation, and I'll wrap up, uh, foundation uh, database, we've just actually uh, written a paper showing that individuals on the spectrum have a far higher prevalence of hypoxia vulnerability genes than, in fact, their typical developing counterparts. That's just using your database. So it suggests that maybe uh, if they get sleep apnea, you would expect that they would have more neural impairment. Certainly, the broad uh, overview of the association with cognition from our perspective is not showing that, but we just may not be using sensitive enough measures. So uh, causes, there are multiple causes, but here are some that uh, sometimes get ignored. Uh, coexisting medical disorders such as epilepsy, GI reflux, sinuses, all sorts of things have to be worked up when you're doing a strong sleep assessment. Medications. So we just uh, submitted a paper to sleep and got rejected on the impact of medications in children on the spectrum. We have about half of our children in this study weren't on medications at all, and the other half are on the usual polypharmacy mix of all sorts from SSRIs to stimulants and so forth. And what we found was very interesting. We really didn't see too much of a difference in terms of the impact of sleep other than the standard SSRI impact on, in fact, uh, slow wave sleep. And so there was no real big difference given that they were actually on the spectrum. And we were told, therefore, our finding was not novel enough. We, we thought it was pretty novel, but we'll, we'll go elsewhere. Certainly, this GABA, serotonin, and, and melatonin associations with sleep that I think these are opportunities. There has been some work relating theta activity to GABA which suggests that, in fact, the, uh, and GABA and uh, the glute ratio is one of those, you know, oft-quoted hypotheses of deficits in individuals on the spectrum. But again, sleep might provide just another window to examining that. So what are my conclusions? So basically, full ambulatory ob objective polysonography can be conducted. We know we can do this on children on the spectrum. No matter what their level of function, this can be achieved. The PSG data suggests that sleep dysregulation and sleep disorders are extremely common in autism. Parents are not imagining this. They're just not good at predicting which disturbances their child has. Circadian rhythm definitely is disrupted, and melatonin is certainly decreased. The evidence seems to be quite strong in that regard. But the clinical trials are somewhat ambiguous, and there seems to be significant variability in how well, in fact, uh, taking melatonin works for improving the sleep. And it doesn't seem to improve the fundamental sleep dysregulation. Sleep disorder breathing appears very common in children with autism, but we're not sure why we in our study are not seeing an impact on cognition or behavior, and why we're seeing actually a reverse impact on the behavior. And then REM sleep appears reduced in children with ASD, but other components of sleep architecture, including theta waves, might be relevant or more relevant for emotional processing and cognitive processing. So I want to thank all my, uh, what you call it, uh, oh, sorry, next steps. I do have one more slide. So future directions, continued studies to understand sleep disorders, sleep architecture, and circadian rhythm. We're really only at the infancy of our understanding of sleep in ASD. Increased investigation of neurodevelopmental consequences of early on sleep disturbance. Maybe we're actually assessing the cognition a little too late. We can sleep, see the sleep dysregulation, but maybe we want to capture this more longitudinally.
Also, greater consideration of other kinds of treatments other than melatonin for the sleep disorders, including their impact on cognition, behavior, and core symptoms. And increased efforts to understand the neurobiology on underlying sleep disorders, A and ASD, including genetics and induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, induced pluripotent stem cells might seem like a stretch here, but we've actually just completed a study of 200 children on the spectrum where we've actually taken their blood to grow up their neurons. And we try to have as many of these children who have sleep disorders actually be in those uh, cohort. Because at the moment, as you know, you just can't do brain biopsy. And although that it's still only a model, I think the particular neuronal model of being able to grow up neurons from these children and actually examine them genetically from a gene expression point, expose them to hypoxia, which we're trying to do, and actually looking at other aspects of the cellular phenotype on a broad scale is probably going to be one of the things that will really help us start to understand how the fundamental biology links to the clinical outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.